Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you'd still our souls this morning so that we can focus on what you have for us from your word. Open our minds and hearts and spirits to your truth and to your presence in our lives and the continuing transformation you're doing in them to make us more and more like you every day. Guide us through your word now by the power and wisdom of your Holy Spirit, we pray. And may my words be your words as we seek to learn and to grow together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are continuing a small series of messages we're doing through October from Communion to Reformation. If you haven't figured that out yet, we did Communion last week with Worldwide Communion Sunday. And the final Sunday in October is Reformation Sunday when we remember the Protestant Reformation and its beginnings. So we're kind of going with the flow through that through this month. So that's why I was telling you that. But today, as I told the kids, we want to talk about glue. Now, we've all used glue and adhesives in one way or another in our lives. And whether we're talking the sticky parts of scotch tape or whether we're talking, um, you know, super glue where we had to glue like pieces of china back together. One of the things that I do now when I have to do plumbing, and I have to confess to you I'm not a plumber, and the Lord is very patient with me when I do plumbing because I tend to <laughs> not be happy about it when I have to. But over the years I've learned that instead of having to use a torch and solder and copper to put pipes together, it's a whole lot easier to just use PVC plastic for the same applications. Because you see, all you have to do is take two pieces of plastic, put glue on both pieces, stick them together, and voila, you made the connection and there are no leaks. There's a special PVC cement, plastic cement, that actually they call it solvent welding. I guess. Again, I'm not a plumber. But what it actually does, I think chemically, is it sort of melts the two pieces of plastic together, binds them together that it can't possibly leak, and it never fails if it's glued properly because you've actually changed the composition of both pieces of pipe. And, hey, listen, in my mind, that's a whole lot simpler than the other stuff. And it works. I have, you know, I've been doing that for some 20 years now, and I haven't had any leaks, anything that I've glued together. So, I, mean, I don't know how long it'll last, but so far, so good. And we've used glue in many kinds of things. I know Sherry this week had to prepare a, a gift for our, my niece's baby shower. So, I walked in the kitchen, and I, what's that smell? And I looked, oh yeah, it's her hot glue gun. You know, when they stick the sticks in there, she was making the thing and gluing it together. And that's a whole lot easier than getting out the needle and thread and stitching something together, right? So we use glue for many things today. And it's because, as from the mouth of babe, she said, it makes stuff stick together. Exactly. And that's what Paul ultimately tells us in this passage that we're reading today, Colossians 1, 15-23. He's telling us at the very end of the passage that that has to be our relationship to Jesus, that we're stuck to him like glue. He doesn't use the term glue, but it's a similar analogy. But before he gets to that conclusion, he builds the case as to why we should be stuck like glue to Jesus. And he begins by talking to us a bit about who Jesus really is. See, the Colossians lived in a place where there was a lot of Greek philosophy. And there were a lot of different truth claims floating around out there. Not just the old pagan Greek religion, but a lot of secular Greek philosophy about the nature of the universe and reality and all these kinds of issues that they were dealing with. So Paul had to get to the nitty gritty to, to cut through all that for them and say, here is the absolute truth about the faith that you now have. Here is the absolute truth about this Jesus that you worship. Remember, many of these Colossians didn't come from Jewish roots. So they didn't have the Old Testament and the knowledge of Yahweh and, and His working in the nation of Israel to 
guide their lives already, as the Jewish converts to Christianity did. So he says here, look, you want to know who Jesus is, let me tell you. Starts in verse 15 in our passage. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He's saying, look, Jesus is God in human form. He truly is not just a man, although he is fully human. He is also fully God. At least as much God as you could stuff into a human body. And he is over all things, he is before all things. Firstborn here doesn't mean he's the first created thing, because he is the eternal part of God. It just means he is before all of that. He's part of the eternal God. He goes on in the next verse. He's not done. He's just warming up here. He says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. The Bible makes it very clear that God is creator and it all belongs to him. Here he's saying, you know, when God became a man in Jesus, it was the creator came and visited his creation. And when Jesus was walking around relating to people, he behaved like a human in the sense that he could communicate and could share in, in the human experience without the sin part of it. But remember, he is still God, so that when he needed to do something miraculous, it was no big deal for him. They ran out of wine at the wedding. Okay, I'll change the molecular composition of water and turn it into wine. Not a problem if you're God. Oh, here's somebody who's been blind from birth? No problem, I'll just make him a new set of eyes. Here's the son of the only son of a woman <coughs> excuse me, who died. No problem, I'll just resurrect him, bring him back to life again. See, the thing I don't like about the way Hollywood shows Jesus is it's like every time he does a miracle, it's like he has to contort himself and go, it's really hard. Like he has to strain himself to do that. Now this is the same God who built the entire, created the entire universe just by speaking it into existence. And the myth that's out there is, well, the reason we have the seventh day is God was tired after doing all the creating, and so he had to rest on the seventh day. Well, he did rest, but that just means the creation was done. He didn't have to do anymore. It wasn't that he was tired because it was so difficult for him. And when Jesus did miracles, it was no more difficult for him to do those than it was to have created the entire universe as the Son, part of the Trinity. So this is what Paul is telling these Colossians. Look, everything you knew about philosophy and religion before this is bunk. Because here is, <coughs> excuse me, here is the one who's made it all. The one who loves us that we worship. Here is the one who has chosen us. And that's where he's going to go with this passage. He's not done what I'm talking about here. He says both the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities... In other words, everything, not just the physical universe did the Lord create. He also created the laws behind it, the intangible things. You know, the, the universe is made of matter and energy. But there's far more in the universe than that that can't be explained by the physical. Things like love and devotion and courage, compassion. How do you measure those? How do you scientifically analyze those? Well, whenever science tries to do that, it makes a fool out of itself because those things aren't physical, but they're still part of the universe. Things even like mathematics or language and certainly music. How in the world could a bunch of atoms have just stuck themselves together to make musical notes? See, it doesn't happen. But it's all part of what Jesus made in this universe. And he also set up 
The structure and the organization of how society would function started with the first couple, Adam and Eve. Okay, there will be marriage, and from that marriage there will be a family. And you get a bunch of families together, you have a community. You get a lot of families together, you have a nation. You get a bunch of different ethnic groups together after the Tower of Babel. You have nations in the world and how they relate to one another. And there are ways that things work versus ways that things don't work. But Jesus set up all of that as part of the creation, is what he's saying. All things have been created through him and for him. Because he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This world belongs to him. And he will come one day to claim it and set everything right. This is who you're worshiping, Colossians. There's nobody greater. So rejoice in that. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It is by the power of God that this universe continues to exist. He's the one who put the structures in it and the properties, the properties of physics and chemistry that hold things together so that things just don't suddenly fly apart. He's the one who built and organized and structured the universe so that there would be physical laws like gravity or friction or heat displacement and other stuff that I'm not an expert on by any means. But all of that has given us an orderly universe that we can depend on. In Him, all things hold together. And if you want to see what real love is, think about that. Even the people who do the most evil and who hate God the most benefit from this holding things together. He doesn't say, oh, you did an evil sin, I'm just going to have all your cells separate and atoms fly apart so that you don't exist anymore. It's not that he couldn't do that. But he doesn't because he created the world the way he wanted it to be. And he gave us the ability to live in it either for good or for evil. And he has willingly submitted himself to keeping that structure the same for everybody. That's one of the reasons why he can be a universal savior to all people. Because we're all made in his image and we all live in this same world that he came to to sacrifice his life for us. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now Paul's making this a little more personal, not just is Jesus a universal God involved with his creation. He is also the head of those who believe in him, the Christian church. He is the beginning of it. He is the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is the first person to ever rise from the dead and never to die again. 1 Corinthians, Paul calls him the first fruits. Very Jewish concept, but very appropriate. He was the one who went first. And because he's alive, we all can live forever. That's what he's saying here. He's the firstborn from the dead. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He deserves to be called Lord. That's why Paul says in Philippians, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Because this is who Jesus is. This is what he deserves. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. He didn't send us something that was partially God or just an angel who ministered close to God. He sent part of Himself into the world. 
the fullness of God within a human being. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace to the blood of his cross. This is the bottom line. As impossible as it sounds, the Lord of creation, the author of creation, becomes a human being and sacrifices his own life, sheds his own blood, own fully human blood, to pay for all of our sins, to make peace with God for us. To make it possible for all of us to become children of God. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. <laughs> and that's where we were. We were all sinful. We all fell short of the glory of God. None of us was good enough to stand in the presence of a holy God. No one who doesn't have Jesus will ever be good enough to stand in the presence of a holy God. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. What a contrast. We're lost in sin. And now because of Jesus, we're pure and holy and have no fear when we stand before a holy God of anything we've ever done to offend him or to break his law. Because of Jesus. Indeed, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast. Now he's challenging the Colossians and us to say, because of these truths, because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done, we need to respond to that by continuing in the faith. And that's a strong phrase in the original language. It's continuing then some. A present continuous tense saying is something that continues on without stopping and failing. And says, firmly established and steadfast. The word established there refers to a foundation of a building. If you want your building to stand, <coughs> to not collapse or tilt or lean, you need a good, solid foundation. He is our foundation upon which we grow. We have been firmly established in Him and nothing can move us because we are connected to Him. And steadfast, that gives the impression of somebody who's sitting in a chair and not going anywhere. I am steadfast in my faith. You're not going to move me out of this chair because I'm sitting here. This is my place. That's how our faith should be when we run into the challenges of life. Oh, this isn't going to shake my faith. This isn't going to drive me away from the Lord. This isn't going to make me doubt Him. I'm going to go to Him and ask for help. I'm going to ask Him for what He has for me and, and how I can have the strength to get through this. <coughs> That's what this steadfastness means here. And not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Moved away is in a literal sense of moving, changing location. I'm going to get out of town. I'm going to relocate. And Paul is saying, look, you're home with Jesus. Why would you want to move away from him? Why would you want to try to go to anybody else or anywhere else for help? Why would you think you could get strength from anybody else or anything else? You know, at one point in his ministry, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, you know, no one can 
come to me unless the Father draw him. And well, some people took offense to that because they were proud of what they did. And some stopped following him. And the disciples came to Jesus and said, well, do you guys want to leave too? Peter looked at him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. In other words, where should I look for answers when I already have it right in front of me? That's what this means. The hope of the gospel alone, the message of Jesus' love and forgiveness, is the ultimate truth. And there's nothing else upon which we should build our lives. And that's why he's telling the Colossians, stand firm in that faith. God has revealed who he is to you. You know ultimate reality and truth in Jesus. You know the purest, most holy, powerful form of love that exists in Jesus. You have the most amazing hope of life eternal with the fullness of life that God himself lives as promised to you in Jesus. Why in the world would you want anything different? And then he concludes this section by saying, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. In other words, God revealed himself to the world in Jesus. It wasn't secret. You didn't have to go through some hidden organization with some mystery incantations to find out some truth about God. Jesus walked, walked around in public and taught and healed and did all of his work. He didn't hide himself. So he's saying you have all that. Why would you want possibly anything else? And so he's saying you need to stay stuck like glue to Jesus. Because he's the only one who can give you the most everything. Everything that you need. Everything that your soul is lacking. And when we think about that in these terms, then there are no problems in life that seem overwhelming. There are no temptations of this world that seem far more enticing. There's no guilt that Satan can throw in our faces. There are no doubts that he can put in our minds that will cause us to pull ourselves apart from that glue-type relationship we have with the Lord Jesus. And the people who even try to do that, they're like... What? One of the other kids said, well, when you try to pull two pieces of paper, you're glued together apart, they rip. And when people try to pull away from God, their lives rip. So don't do it. This is the ultimate hope. And Paul wants us to understand that in our lives. And if we're struggling in any areas of our lives with things, with problems, with temptations, with burdens, it should make us want to grab a hold of Jesus tighter. Say, Lord, hang on to me. Carry me if necessary, but don't let go, don't let me let go of you. And if we do that, there's nothing that will overcome us. There's nothing that can defeat us. And there's nothing that can take away our hope of being with the Lord and all the others who believe in heaven forever one day. So, like I told the kids, next time you're doing something with glue, remember this. That when things get stuck together, they're not coming apart again. That's the way we need to be with our Lord Jesus. And if we are, it'll be amazing. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank you that you love us with this amazing, powerful love. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to come and limit yourself to being a human being and show us God's amazing love and that you're willing to sacrifice yourself willingly on the cross for all of our sins. And we thank you that you offer that forgiveness and that eternal life through your resurrection to anybody who wants it. We pray, Lord, that you will work in our lives to live that out every day. Guide us to how we can live lives that are full and rich and honoring to you. Help us to not fret about things or problems or deal with guilt or <clears throat> embarrassment about being human and failing from time to time. But help us to know that you have a plan and as long as we hang on to you tight, that plan will happen and it will be the best possible results for us. Thank you, Father, for all that you have taught us. Thank you for all that you want us to learn. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for this amazing love and care you give to us each and every day. For it is in your name we pray. Amen.